Why, hello to all, and welcome back to War Thunder Ground Forces. I'm Breda Templar, and for today's video we're going to be having a look at the M4A5, a Canadian premium tank down the American tree of uh, War Thunder Ground Forces. But before we get into all that, I just want to say that I do apologise for not making a video last weekend. Uh, I was going to make a video, and I got some really good clips of the event that was happening on that day, that was the uh, Battle of the Ardennes event. Uh, but unfortunately, my recording software... Well, I say my recording software. War Thunder has decided to start doing this really annoying sound problem that makes all my clips sound like, well, this. And although it may be hard to believe, I'm actually not showing this footage on a 1920s film projector, as what the background noise may make it sound like. Um, and I genuinely don't know why it's doing this, but sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I don't know why, I couldn't find anything on fixing it. And uh, if anyone knows how to fix it, then uh, do give me a bit of a holler, eh? Thanks. So anyway, back onto the tank in question, and, well, this is certainly a very interesting tank in the way that it's pretty controversial, and my opinions on this, ch on this uh, tank has changed dramatically over my time uh, playing with it. So, yeah, it's gonna be a bit of an interesting one to talk about this. But anyway, before we get into all that, uh, let's firstly have a look at the history of the tank. And as this is a premium tank, there isn't going to be a whole lot on it, uh, because often premium tanks are, well, never really have much on them, unfortunately. So uh, yeah, if you don't want to hear the history, skip to the time on your screens now. Otherwise, let's get straight into it. So then, the M4A5 Ram was a Canadian cruiser tank that was designed and built by Canada during the Second World War. Now, its origins of said tank, despite it being officially designed in 1941, actually go as far back as before the Battle for France actually begun. This is because that, quite simply, the United Kingdom realised that they could not design and build enough tanks fast enough for the war effort, and that the other parts of the British Empire would have to look into designing and producing their own variants of tanks if they wanted to use them. But it's true to say that Canada was not the only country who got this memo, and in fact every part of the British Empire was basically warned that in the off chance that we are either cut off from you, or we don't have enough tanks to supply you, then well, you might want to start thinking about making your own tanks, just in case. And it was because of this that an entire generation of homegrown tanks were made, from not just Canada, but also other countries such as New Zealand and Australia. Although it is true to say that this generation of homegrown tanks were, well, not the best really. Um, but you can't really be mad at these countries for not making the best tanks because Quite simply, most of these countries had never built tanks before, and to the few who had, they were either just building them, so they never actually designed them themselves, or they had designed tanks, but they were very outdated, or they didn't have the proper amount of materials and resources to build good tanks, as you can see on your screens now. I mean, other than the RAM here, you can also see there is the AC-1 Sentinel, which was the Australian main battle tank design, which was basically a tank made of every bit of weapon and armour and cannon that the British had left the Australians with, and they sort of threw it all together as to try and make a tank. And it's true, the AC-1 was, well, I mean, it never saw combat, but from design standards alone, 
it wasn't half bad, and if it did have to see combat, I couldn't imagine it doing too badly, if we're perfectly honest. And yes, that T-34 did just bounce my shell like it was nothing, and then one hit kill me. Thanks, Gaijin. But anyway, back onto the actual history of this tank, and as it's now sort of gone on to all of the homegrown British Empire tanks, and, uh, well, Australia, as I already said, was doing fairly well with their own tank designs, so let's now have a look at New Zealand's designs, and oh, oh no, oh no. Now, let's be fair to New Zealand here, uh, as they were running on very low equipment and resources, and their population isn't very big, and they had absolutely no idea how to build tanks, really, um, and in fact, they sort of didn't even really have the industry to build or mass-produce, uh, you know, heavy tanks and that, so it was kinda left to the civilians to do all of the tank designs. Uh. So anyway, let's go into the intricately well-designed and uh, heavily armoured vehicles that the New Zealanders made. And let's firstly start off with the Bob Semple tractor. Oh, sorry, did I say tractor? I meant tank, apparently. But anyway, uh, so yes, the Bob Semple tank was a thing. Like, it actually existed, with about 8 to 12 millimetres of armour. So, you know, up to an inch of armour. And with its main armament of six Bren guns. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that if the Japs ever dared come near this thing, uh, with its six bren light machine guns, it could beat any Tiger tank that this thing could possibly come up against. And, with a 5 horsepower engine, it's about as fast as they come, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I don't like to brag, but this is one hell of a tank. And next up, we have the Schofield Light Tank Wheel and Track, which is a light tank, apparently. I mean, I don't really know who they're trying to fool here. This is quite clearly, at best, an armoured car, and at worst... Uh, I, I don't know, even know, a heap of junk. But, either way, this was actually almost usable in a combat situation, as it weighed only five tons, and it was fairly short, with only six to ten millimeters of armor, however, but it did actually come with a cannon this time. So, already, massive improvements. But, uh, yeah, it came with the QF2 Pounder, and even came with a secondary Beezer machine gun, which was actually a pretty good machine gun, and came with a whopping 30 horsepower engine this time, which allowed it to go as fast as 45 miles an hour, which, you know, even though I've been taking the piss out of these tanks so far, I have to admit, that's pretty impressive. And, in fact, the design itself is actually pretty clever, because you see, those wheels and tracks are actually interchangeable. So if you're going on-road, you can put down the wheels and then drive at your max speed of 45 miles an hour, and if you're going off-road, you can put down the tracks, which still puts you at a respectable speed of 27 miles an hour. So to be fair with the Schofield, it wasn't the worst design in the world, however, it does receive the the award for probably the best burn ever given by the British when it came to this tank, as when it was sent to the UK to be evaluated by the Department of Tank Design, they advised them to politely stop doing what they're doing. Yeah, I know, it's brilliant. So, uh, yeah, that was a bit of a tangent I just went on, talking about all of the early war Commonwealth tanks, but, uh, ah, well, you know, it's, it's all a bit of fun, really, and I'm sure you all enjoyed your time here. So, uh, yeah, I digress back onto the RAM, which you may have forgotten by now, but was actually the entire point of this video.
So anyway, back on to the RAM, and well, basically, at the start of the war, the British basically allowed the Canadians to start building their own designs of tanks, and in fact, the Canadians actually ended up building about 500 Valentine tanks for Canada, uh, just in case they were invaded or had to fight for whatever reason. But, after some time, it was decided that they should make their own tank, and they were pretty interested in the American M3 medium tank, that was still pretty new at that time, and was, in the eyes of the Canadians, well, a bit rubbish. I mean, the M3 Lee was not a bad tank by any stretch of the imagination, but the Canadians felt that it was too tall, it was under-armoured, and its main cannon was in the side with a very small firing range, which, all in all, they felt was just not very good, and they decided to, in the end, actually take it up anyway, but to modify the design to something they felt was a lot better. Cue the RAM. And in fact, if you look at the design of the tank, you can see that it does hold a very strong resemblance of the M3 Lee, especially the chassis, which is pretty much identical to the M3 Lee, and was pretty much the only part they didn't make any major changes to. So, with all this in mind, the actual production started in November of 1941, but there weren't actually enough six-pounder guns that they were intending on using for its main armament at this time, so a lot of the first ones were built with only two-pounder guns, something that was becoming very quickly outdated, even for its day. But luckily, by February 1942, they had started on the Ram 2 design, this one now with the six-pounder gun, which continued until July 1943. However, by 1943, it was thought that these tanks were a bit outdated, and it was decided to change all of the factories who were producing the Rams to those that were producing the M4A1 Sherman, a tank that was used all over the British Empire, and was seen as overall superior. All in all, just under 2,000 rams were produced, including 84 of their artillery observation post variant, which, mind you, is a very interesting variant, and one that I sort of hope will eventually get to War Thunder. But how do they perform in combat, I hear you ask? And, well, no one will ever know, as, unfortunately, no ram ever saw combat. However, they were used extensively through training, and, in fact, were used in both Canada and the United Kingdom for training purposes. However, this isn't the end of the history of the Ram tank, as, in actual fact, the Ram tank was capable of being converted into many different variants, one of which was the Wasp II flamethrower, that were used by the 5th Canadian Armoured Brigade in the Netherlands in 1945. Now, although it is unclear as to if these flamethrower variants ever actually saw combat, or perhaps were just used as training, or perhaps just for overall civilian repression, or some other less important tasks, what we can say for sure is in 1945, the Royal Netherlands Army got permission from Canada to take all of the rams that were in Dutch territory. Now, of these that weren't converted over to the kangaroo transport variant, they were actually put into the 1st and 2nd Dutch tank battalions, which formed the very first Dutch tank units ever. So there you go. Even though these never saw frontline combat, it was because of these that allowed the birth of the Dutch tank battalions that are still around to this very day. But all things must come to an end, and in fact, in 1952, these rams were officially changed over 
to the Centurion tanks that were leased by the US government. But even now, this was not completely the end for this tank, as in fact, across the, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, the Isel line in the Netherlands, they were put as solid bunkers across said line, which basically, for those who aren't aware, was the Netherlands part of the Cold War line splitting the east and west of Europe. So, in case there was a war that broke out, these turrets may well have been used in the front lines to fight off the old Rushkis. And in fact, many of these turrets that were encased, because they weren't just rams, there were also other Sherman tanks, were also put into this line, are still there today. And in fact, you can go and see them, still to this day, because no one ever moved them. So, there you go. That is the pretty much complete history of the RAM. And, well, without further ado, as this video has gone for far too long already, let's get straight into how well it does in War Thunder, and see if it is actually any good in combat, or at least in combat in War Thunder, that is. So then, the RAM 2, as it is in War Thunder, is a 3.7 battle rating rank 2 American premium tank, which already brings up a lot of confusing questions, such as why is it in the American tree when it's clearly a British Commonwealth tank? Uh, and I think there's probably one of two reasons why they put it there, both of which make no sense, mind you, but it's, it's the sort of logic Gaijin runs on. Uh, such things as a, this tank is mostly based off the M3 Lee, so, you know, perhaps they thought it was more American than British, but then again, that doesn't explain it, because there are Sherman tanks in the British line, so that doesn't explain it at all. Or perhaps they thought it's because Canada's closer to America than uh, the UK, which would be true, but then again, that would mean that the Australian Sentinel should also be in the American tree, as Australia is closer to America than uh, Canada, UK, sorry. So yeah, neither of those make any sense, uh, but knowing Gaijin is probably the logic they run on, so I don't know, um, and I sort of hope that they do get around to putting it into the British tree, because God knows it should be in it. But anyway, let's get actually into how well it performs in War Thunder, as we have a look at the advantages and disadvantages of this tank. Now, the first advantage on my list is the fact that this tank has pretty good armour all around for a 3.7 battle rating tank. I mean, the frontal armour can easily get up to the equivalent of 200 millimeters worth of protection, which will quite happily stop pretty much anything you're ever going to come up against. So, all in all, uh, its armor can be pretty good if used correctly. Another significant advantage is the fact that this tank has a very fast reload speed at around 4 to 5 seconds depending on your crew. Now, I just want to keep in mind that for its battle rating, most tanks have more around 6, 7, 8, and sometimes even beyond a second's worth of reload time, so 4 to 5 is very fast. However, this may be due to the fact that it only fires solid shot, uh, but more onto that in a moment. Which leads us on to the disadvantages of this tank, and, well, first off the bat, as already mentioned, unfortunately, this only fires solid shot. And when I say only solid shot, I do literally mean that. I mean, this doesn't even have high explosive shells. I'm not entirely sure why, granted, but, um, either way, it just doesn't for some reason. And, of course, as it is a British um, tank, it also means that it has no high-explosive armor-piercing shells either, um, so firing one shot will often not 
knock out an enemy tank and it will take on average two to three shots to really beat some um, pretty much any enemy with any decent sized crude tank. Another disadvantage with this tank and is probably the worst disadvantage about this tank if I uh, do say so myself is the armor which although I do still stand by what I originally said of it has very good armor for its battle rating it only has good armor where it wants to have good armor yes unfortunately this tank has some really quite massive weak spots uh, such as the driver's hatch which is only about 50, 50 to 60 millimeters thick and is pretty flat not only that but the transmission uh, which is a massive uh, thing to hit so you're never gonna miss that also only has about 50 to 60 so yeah as far as armor's concerned I find this tank hard to call one of these sort of unpenetrable sort of tanks but at the same time I wouldn't say it was a lightly armored or easy to beat tank and in fact I found that 9 times out of 10 I survive for a surprisingly long amount of time in this tank when I'm against players who never shoot for the weak spots and don't know what they're coming up against. I mean, my first ever game in this tank, I loved it because no one could penetrate me. I was completely unstoppable. But as I then played more games, I suddenly realized that that was not the case at all and I must have just got really lucky and they must have just kept shooting off the heavy armor. So, yeah, every time you get shot in this tank, it's basically like flipping a coin as to if they're going to hit part of you that's well armored or not. Or at least that is when they're attacking the front of your tank, mind you, because if they shoot the sides or rear of your tank, then you definitely don't have enough armor for, well, stopping pretty much anything, really. Another big issue with this tank is the fact that it's pretty small considering it has five crew members. Yes, unfortunately this is quite a cramped tank and you will find quite a lot of the time that your crew will keep getting knocked out by one high explosive shell. Uh, I mean, if it, this thing is shot in the turret, pretty much regardless of if the shot is high explosive or not, it'll kill the entire turret crew um, and if someone shoots through the front driver's plate which already said is a very weak spot on it even if that's not high explosive it's still got a good chance of knocking out your entire crew or at least four of your five crew members in pretty much one shot so once again as far as armor's concerned and armor spacing it's still not really the best and that largely concludes the major advantages and disadvantages of this tank. Of course, not speaking about the fact that, well, of course, it's premium, so that could be considered an advantage and a disadvantage, because A, you have to pay real money for it, but B, it allows you to level up faster, so I'm not going to put that in either. So, uh, yeah, this video has gone on for long enough as it is already, so I'm afraid this will be uh, split into two videos. So, um, yes, I thank you very much for watching. Uh, this video will come out this week. I'm imagining part two will come out some point next week. And, uh, yeah, until next time, I say I thank you very much. And make sure to tune in then when you find out whether or not you should get the M4A5 RAM.